I feel honored, my brethren and sisters, this morning to be in the presence of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and my fellow associates in the cause of Jesus the Master. This vast congregation is most humbling. I have sought the inspiration of the Spirit in the few thoughts that I have prepared. Men seek for a phrase or a slogan to motivate and give impetus to action under certain conditions. History refers to such statements as, give me liberty or give me death, or we have only begun to fight, and surrender never, we will die first. Modern slogans have also had their effect, such as V for victory and the peace and freedom symbols of crowded demonstrators. Formulas for living, how to attain a peaceful world civilization, is common vogue today as exponents of opposing ideologies hurl their challenges. Men are constantly seeking for an answer to an easier and better way of life. Be that as it may, and concerning slogans as an answer to a problem, I am not prepared to say, but for a realistic and productive life, the Prophet Joseph Smith gives these statements which, which might well be a panacea to our troubles. Cease to be idle. Cease to be unclean. Cease to find fault one with another. Cease to sleep longer than is needful. Retire to thy bed early that ye may not be weary. Arise early that your bodies and your minds may be invigorated. This last statement is a little controversial with many different ideas. I once heard of a man by the name of Wilson who slept so much that his friends named him Rip Van Wilson. <laughs> he said, I don't sleep long, I just sleep slow. <laughs> A great thinker of our modern days supports the statement of the Lord concerning idleness, for said he, when a man shuns effort, he is in opposition to resist temptation. So through all the ages, idleness has been known as the parent of all vices, the dry rot of weariness and discontent, the vague self-disgust of those who cannot deal with time is the natural result of idleness, the indolent discontent of the hopelessly rich and the indolent misery of the helplessly poor have this much in common. Life drives him hard who has nothing to do in the world. Concerning chastity and cleanliness as associated with righteous dominion, the Lord gave this direction. Let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God and the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion, and thy scepter an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth, and thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion. And without compulsory means it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. Concerning our fellow man and attitude toward him, the Prophet Joseph Smith gave this purposeful thought, and let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. And again I say unto you, let every man esteem his brother as himself. For a man to seek ascendancy over another man, by the suppressing of his righteous, his rights, is non-virtuous and would not tie in with the words of the Master who said, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 
As to sleep and rest, the prophet Joseph Smith in saying, cease to sleep longer than is needful, does not mean, as Dr. John A. Witzer states it, that one should sleep a certain minimum number of hours. Nine hours is a minimum, minimum for some adults, while others seem to keep healthy on seven or less. Authorities on child nutrition insist that many undernourished children are lacking not good food, but enough sleep. Perhaps the late TV shows are taking a toll in this regard. But what I believe that the prophet is saying about more sleep than is needful concerns the individual who goes far beyond the need, developing slothful and lazy habits, which deaden the senses and become a retarder of accomplishment. Now to adjust to all these things in life requires discipline and restraint. Soon after Adam and Eve, our first parents, were driven from the Garden of Eden because of their yielding to temptation. They came to know the difference between right and wrong and good and evil. For thus the Lord declared, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. Without a knowledge of good and evil, the divine principle of agency would be ineffectual. The application of this law, while serving to elevate man, can also condemn him. For that in which we participate, whether it is good or evil, either defiles us or exalts us. Concerning this, the Master has said, There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. There is weakness in the thought that one can indulge heavily in both evil and good things at the same time. Many centuries ago, Jesus said that man cannot serve two masters. He will either love one and despise the other, or hate the one and love the other. The Apostle James emphasized the importance of constantly choosing right over wrong. To those who attempt an allegiance to both right and wrong, he declared, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Man is the sum result of what he thinks and does. Habit is the instrument that molds his character and makes of him essentially what he is. Habit can become a monster to tarnish and destroy, yet proper behavioral traits can bring lasting joy and achievement. To say no at the right time and then stand by it is the first element of success. The effect that both good and bad habits have on our lives is all too real to be ignored. Bad habits which violate the commandments of physical health and of moral behavior given by revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith many years ago become such that will threaten and destroy all opportunities for real happiness. The experience of countless families, the demonstration of crowded hospitals, treating misfit cases caused by drug addiction in its many forms, such as alcohol, tobacco, and the use of capsules, and the injections of a high and stimulating nature is straining the stability of our present civilization. Sicknesses such as they are, which sometimes induce improper and wrongful habits, should of course be treated with our modern techniques. It is nevertheless true, however, that all too often that which we are unwilling to cope with, and which otherwise could be controlled by personal restraint, is regarded in our modern way of thinking as a form of sickness. And therefore, the indulger is led to believe that he is free of moral obligation. Where such is the case, one can be led to believe that he can excuse injurious acts of indulgence upon the basis that what he does is the result of a sickness, and he is really not to blame. The psychological effect in such cases is most devastating 
and in reality is a compounding of the wrongful indulgence. The practice of restraint is a necessary attribute of every gentle and good man. Women without it become coarse and unrefined, to curb the appetites and passions, to screen wisely the thoughts permitted to enter our minds, to avoid the habit that does not produce the spiritual and abundant life our experiences of life to be concerned with if the crown of achievement and the nobility of good character are to be possessed. Choosing good over evil and right over wrong is the crowning achievement of life. And in so doing, man becomes the masterpiece of the Creator and fulfills the basic purposes of our mortal probation. An ancient prophet speaks of it in this way, he that conquereth himself is greater than he that taketh the city. Among the last words spoken unto his, his beloved apostle John, while in vision on the Isle of Patmos, are these, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The fusing of ritual and commandment with everyday living calls for the best that is in us, that by our agency we feel the affected condition by choosing good rather than evil, thus not only to glorify ourselves, but to glorify him who has made all things possible. Concerning the need of fusing obedience to the will of God, the prophet Joseph Smith gave this important and wise counsel. I quote, we take the sacred writings into our hands and admit that they were given by direct inspiration for the good of man. We believe that God condescended to speak from the heavens and declare his will concerning the human family, to give them just and holy laws to regulate their conduct and guide them in a direct way, that in due time he might take them to himself and make them joint heirs with his son. But when this fact is admitted, that the immediate will of heaven is contained in the scriptures, are we not bound as rational creatures to live in accordance to all its precepts? Will the mere admission that this is the will of heaven ever benefit us if we do not, com if we do not comply with all teachings? Do we not offer violence to the supreme intelligence of heaven when we admit the truth of its teachings and do not obey them? Do we not descend below our own knowledge and the better wisdom which heaven has endowed us with by such a course of conduct?" End of quote. I bear my testimony to you, my brothers and sisters, that I know that the gospel is true. When I entered the top floor of the temple the other day, the general authorities, the regional representatives and their wives, it was as though I could hear many voices saying the gospel is true. The gospel is true. I have had the assurance of this since the day as a young missionary in Pennsylvania when I placed a Book of Mormon in the hands of an investigator who went directly to a clump of bushes in a park to ask God if this book was true. He returned convinced and asked for baptism. And later when a farmer in Pennsylvania met us at the farm gate to say, I have been expecting you. I have seen you in my dreams. And after a day and night of giving them the message of the restoration to witness this family of five request baptism, which was accomplished by damming the creek in the back of their barn, I know that God lives, that Jesus is the Christ, that Joseph Smith and his successors, including President Joseph Ewing Smith, are prophets of God. Of this I testify, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.